We're good. Hello, everybody. Um, we've got a bit of an interesting setup tonight because we have someone who is going to be joining us on the screens all the way from out west. So uh, my name is Rachel McMillan, and I am very excited to be here at the Great Book Stage. I'll be your host this evening um, with Genevieve Graham, who will be on the screen, Amita Perrick, and Anne Lazurko. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take this moment to acknowledge the history of the place where we are gathered today. The City of Toronto exists because of the Toronto Purchase also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. The territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Ashinawabi, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace which we all now share responsibility in upholding. The dish with one spoon was born in part of the Anishinaabeg concept of all our relations, which is the awareness that we are connected to and reflected in all of the living and non-living beings around us. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people with long histories on this land and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honours these people. So, now I'd like to introduce our authors. We have Genevieve Graham, author of Bluebird, which if you follow books at all in Toronto or have wandered into a bookstore recently, you have seen because it is a national and international bestseller. She is the USA Today and number one bestselling author of The Forgotten Home Child, Letters Across the Sea, Tides of Honor, Promises to Keep, Come From Away, and At the Mountain's Edge. Her latest, Bluebird, was published in April 2022. Genevieve is passionate about breathing life into Canadian history through tales of love and adventure. And next to me, I have Anne Lazurko, author of What is Written on the Tongue. Anne is the author of the novel What is Written on the Tongue, ECW Press, this year. Her first novel, Dolly Bird, won the Willa Award for Historical Fiction, and her short prose and poetry is published in Canadian literary magazines and anthologies. She writes from her farm near Weyburn, Saskatchewan. That's so cool. And here you are with us <laughs> as we try to see if it's going to rain or not. And then we have Amita Perrick. Oh, there's Genevieve. Hello. Um, author of The Circus Train. Amita was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. She earned an honors Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, which is like right around us, and works in the tech industry. The Circus Train is her first novel. On behalf of The Word on the Street, I'd like to thank you all for attending the event here at Great Book Stage. Join us tomorrow for the second day of the festival, kicking off at 10 a.m. with a conversation featuring Matter Anand, Michael Frazier, and D.A. Lockhart. So before we get started, I am just going to ask our amazing authors if they will do a short reading from their most recent book. So I'll start with Genevieve. Genevieve, you look amazing in blue to celebrate Bluebird. It's nice oh, to see thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I had to look far and wide to find just the right uh -huh. blue. And I think I, and I have one here too, so it's like physically in person. Um. That's, that's a beautiful thing, Rachel. I'm really sorry I'm not there in person to give you a big hug. But hello from Edmonton. Hello. All right. Um, so you would like me to do a little reading? Yes, if you could. Thank you. All right. Let me give you a little bit of an in sort of an introduction on what I'm going to read to you. So Bluebird, the, the title Bluebird is set um, because in World War I, the only job that a Canadian woman could have overseas was as a Canadian nursing sister. And our nursing sisters wore blue gowns with white aprons over top, and the men in their care took to calling them Bluebirds. Um, apparently, we had the prettiest gowns of all, and the, uh, the American and the um, and the UK nurses were a little bit jealous, but we had our beautiful bluebirds. So I start my story um, in Belgium in a hospital clearance center, which is one of those sort of semi, um, semi-mobile hospitals that they would bring as close to the front as possible um, near a railway, so they could bring in um, different men as they were injured and get them back out and get them to, to bigger hospitals if they needed to. And my nurse that I'm reading from here is Adele. She's the She's been on her feet for about 14 hours. She got about two hours sleep, and then they were called out again 
it, so I'm just going to read to you what happened. There has been um, an attack from above. Um, all that day, ambulance was very full of this from the front to the hospital. They arrived soaked and shivering from the wind and rain, broken and bleeding from enemy machine gun fire or shell, some crying, some silent from shock. Adele heard snatches of conversation from those who were conscious, some claiming the Allies had won the battle, others merely shaking their heads with frustration and defeat. Adele rushed to triage them, supporting men who could walk to a bed, directing stretcher bearers for those who could not. She unwound bloodied bandages, cleaned and treated wounds as best as she could while the men waited for a doctor, then she wrapped them up again. The hours blended together in a rancid swamp of blood, tears, and exhaustion. Excuse me, sister, a voice called. Adele had just finished a difficult debridement, clearing necrotic tissue from a case of gas gangrene on the inside of a man's thigh. And she turned toward the, the speaker as she removed her rubber gloves. He was tall and dark haired, and the fibers of his uniform were stiff with dried mud and blood, but she could see no obvious wound. Are you injured, Corporal? Bailey, John Bailey. No, sister, it's not me. He pointed at a man on a cot across the tent. You see the fellow there at the very end? Is he all right? Will he be all right? I'm sorry, I really don't know. I haven't had a chance to go to him. He's my brother, he said quietly. Please help him. She'd heard that before. He's my brother, he's my friend. Those beautiful, terrible words tore men apart and scarred her every time. Why don't you go sit with him? I'll be right there. Thank you, he said, then took off like a bull towards his brother. Adele paused to give her patient with the gas gangrene a reassuring touch, but he barely moved in acknowledgement. Then she went for a fresh pair of gloves, a bucket of water, and a clean cloth from the trolley before making her way to her new charge. The charge at the end of the bed read, Corporal Jeremiah Bailey, 1st Canadian Tunneling Company, facial lacerations, multiple fractured ribs. So these men were tunnelers, members of the courageous breed who dug beneath the trenches, blocking and bombing the Germans. She'd never seen a tunneler before, not a live one anyway. John was hovering over Jeremiah, gently trying to rouse him. The corporal's face was wrapped in stained linen, so Adele got to work, peeling back the dirty bandages and cleaning the skin underneath. She didn't want to touch the wrong place and accidentally do more harm, but she had to be thorough. The doctor would need the patient to be clean before he could help with anything. With forceps, she tugged at a piece of gauze, but it was stuck to dried blood. Jeremiah gasped and his eyes slitted open. I'm so sorry, Corporal Bailey, she said, cutting the cloth free with scissors instead. Jerry, John said. Jeremiah's eyes rolled to his brother. I'm all right. The words rode on an exhalation, squeezed through motionless lips, husky and quiet as if made with the least possible effort. But there would have been a great effort made, Adele knew. Jesus, Jerry, John whispered. She felt the cheek quiver slightly under her cloth in acknowledgement of the sentiment and felt a vague twinge of shame listening in on such an intimate offering between the brothers. She focused on wringing out the cloth, darkening the water in her bucket to a dull copper brown. After a few minutes, the left side of Jeremiah's face was recognizable. It was bruised, and there was a small cut on his brow, but that was all. The damage must be on the other side. I'll just switch spots with you if you don't mind, she said to John. Once in place, she pressed tentatively against the bandage covering the right side of Jeremiah's face, feeling for the definition of bone. She'd seen jaws blown off before. The shock of that terrible wound had sent her behind the tent, retching the first and second time. She was more prepared now but always nervous. I'll be very careful, Corporal Bailey, she promised, loosening the bandage with a syringe of warm water. Jerry, just call him Jerry, would you? He's Jerry, I'm John, we're the Bailey brothers. Of course, but it was so hard to think of the men in here like that, to give them names and homes and families. It made it so much more difficult to say goodbye. Jerry, he said gently, I'm going to start under your chin and work my way up, all right? He looked at her through clear gray eyes, the color of winter storm clouds. Then he blinked slowly before regarding his brother. John laughed. Nothing wrong with your vision, I see. Adele raised an eyebrow. Did I miss something? No, sister, John said. But she could tell what it was from the guilt in his expression. It wasn't the first time she'd heard these kind of comments or felt the men's lonely energy. She was aware of them watching her, thinking about her in ways they ought not to. But she didn't really mind, especially after all they'd been through. There was no harm in their glances. If any of them got the least bit out of hand, all she had to do was touch her veil and lead, they'd leave off. So she rarely corrected those who thought she was a nun anymore. To her relief, 
Jerry's jaw was whole. That left his cheek and temple where the bandages were suffused with dark full of black blood. Adele straightened, stretching her back, then went for fresh water. When she returned, she set her bucket down and looked at John. Would you mind putting your hand on his arm, she asked. The pain often makes them reach for the wound, and it will be much easier on him if I can get this done quickly. He placed his hand on Jerry's forearm, but only rested it there. Maybe he didn't understand. Hold tight, she advised. John shook his head, unconcerned. He won't move. She wanted to tell him that he had no idea that she'd seen it a hundred times, but she didn't feel like lecturing. How hard it must be to see his brother like this. She couldn't imagine watching Marie suffer. It would be so much more difficult than being in pain herself, she thought. Jerry's eyes had closed, though she saw movement beneath. He let out a long breath, preparing himself, and she did the same. She started slowly. The veins in Jerry's neck pulsed with effort, but his brother was right. He didn't cry out, and his hands never reached to stop her as she removed the gauze, revealing two very deep cuts. One carved a straight, horizontal line from beneath his ear and through his bristled cheeks so she could see the bloody white of his teeth. Miraculously, the damage had stopped beneath his nose on his lip. The second laceration ran from almost the same spot under his ear and passed across the bridge of his nose, terrifyingly close beneath his eye. How did this happen? She asked. It looks like shrapnel. Weren't you underground? We were, but Germans broke through, set off a camouflage, John said, sagging slightly. That's how they got in. The Germans were in your tunnel? They dig their own and our paths can cross. Sometimes it works in our favor. Not this time. Aren't those tunnels quite narrow? Yes, ma'am, about three or four feet wide, maybe five feet from the floor to the ceiling. The hard part's knowing in the dark who you're standing beside. You don't want to kill the wrong man. How can you tell who's who? He tapped his shoulder with one hand. The Germans have epaulets on their uniforms. We don't, so we feel for them. Adele stopped, speechless. In her mind, she saw the men in the murky blackness underground, fumbling desperately for that extra bit of fabric on the shoulders of the enemy's coats. A huff of air escaped Jerry's nose, and she turned her attention back to him. I didn't find out until after we'd killed the Germans that Jerry had been hit by the blast, John went on. He'd been thrown back, but the shrapnel caught him on the way. He was buried when I got to him. She shouldn't have asked. Somehow, out of necessity, she'd hardened herself to the things she saw in the hospital day in and day out, but hearing how the wounds before her had been inflicted made them so real. Thank God you found him, she whispered, as she wrung her cloth out one last time. Considering the extreme damage, the pain resulting from her tender touch should have been practically unbearable, and yet Jerry hadn't flinched. She hoped there wasn't nerve damage. The doctor will be by soon to stitch you up. He's very good, but you will have a scar, I'm afraid. Too bad, Jerry. Like I've always said, you'll never be as handsome as me. Some ladies like scars, Adele's teased. John's low-throated laugh filled the hushed room. Jerry closed his eyes, and she thought maybe he was smiling inside. I gotta get back, John said eventually. Jerry stiffened. Adele saw the pull between them as if it were a rope drawn tight. John clearly wanted to embrace his brother, but settled for a light pat on the shoulder. Then Jerry lifted a hand, and his brother clasped it. Don't worry. I'll be careful, John said. Then he turned to Adele. Look after him, all right? I will, she promised. Jerry watched John until he disappeared, a sparkle of tears at the corners of his eyes. It's okay, Jerry, she said. You're safe. I'll take care of you. But later, as she gave him morphine in preparation for the surgery, and his eyelids grew heavy with the drug, a terrible thought came to Adele. If only Jerry had hurt, been hurt more severely, if he had lost a limb or more of his face, they'd send him home. If he recovered from this wound, he'd be back at the front with his brother in short order, facing death once more. That's so awesome. And uh, Genevieve can't be here, but definitely... Uh definitely pick up her book at another story um, or anywhere. It's everywhere. So uh, next, if Anne, if you could introduce us to uh, a little bit of a scene from your book. Sure. Um, I'll just tell you my, my novel, What is Written on the Tongue, is set in, in Indonesia during the Indonesian War of Independence uh, in 1947, shortly after the Second World War. And my protagonist, uh, Sam, is with Dutch forces. Uh, They're trying to regain the colony after the Second World War. And he and some of his mates are on patrol, and uh, they come across an abandoned shed. And I'll just start from, from that point. 
Raj stands back as Dharma crouches beside the door. It creaks as Sam shoves it open and moves past sticky wisps of cobweb, an incredible smell of dank rot filling his nose as he pushes into the blackness. Suddenly, the moonlight spills through the doorway and bounces across the inside of the shed. A scream clogs his throat. Shrouded figures lean against the walls, tightly wedged together and propped as though having a party conversation. He backs away, heart pounding even as he tells himself they aren't real turning to see another body by the door, bent forward at the waist and ushering him out. His bayonet knocks it soundlessly to the floor, a soft billow of dust as he rushes past it and scrambles to hide, be hide behind a tree at the edge of the clearing. Sam, it's okay. Raj comes towards him. The bastard is laughing. A flutter above and Sam glances up to see a piece of white cloth shrouding another figure wedged in the crook of branches a smaller bundle propped on top. He takes a wild shot, misses. A hand on his shoulder nearly stops his heart, Raj laughing so hard he can't speak, Dharma behind him doubled over, shaking, shoulders shaking with great hiccups. Dead, Raj chokes on his laughter. They're already dead. I can see that. Sam tries to calm his breathing, looks around in the growing moonlight to see other figures in other trees, shrouded like the first. What the hell is this? A death pavilion. Well, yes, it certainly is. They're waiting to be buried. What? It takes three days for the dead to realize their situation, Dharma chimes in. In between, they're resentful of the living. Families try to confuse the soul so it won't haunt them. So they put them in a tree? No, Dharma laughs. L Dharma's laugh barks into the night, no. After three days, the soul leaves the body as an insect, maybe a bird, but it will only pass to the land of the ancestors after a proper celebration with offerings, feasting, dancing. Death is complicated and expensive. Families store the body like this until they can afford the funeral. Dharma gestures at the shed, the bodies in the trees. The war has made people poor. Seriously, that's crazy. Everyone has their way of the dead. Andre, Freddy, Willem, and Bart burst into the clearing behind them. What the hell, Andre hollers? We heard a shot. Out of the corner of his eye, Sam catches the horror on Bart's face as he registers the figure's outlined ghostly white in the moonlight. Freddy and Andre follow his gaze, and before ca Sam can stop them, the men are firing into the trees. Shrouds and bones and bodies flutter to the ground, hitting not with a thud, but gently, like angels or demons. The men ignore Raj and Dharma yelling at them to stop, instead firing blindly into the trees as though making up for every rebel they've been unable to find, every suspect villager they didn't shoot, unloading their anxiety and fear and anger on the already dead. More men come running from camp, wide-eyed at ten bodies in various stages of decay scattered on the ground. Fuck. Raj looks at Dharma. They have no idea what they've done, Dharma says, picking up bones and shrouds and bundling them into the shed. Where laughter had been, his voice is taut with anger. Not the end of the world, Sam says hopefully, an unreasonable fear growing in him as he re-wraps re a skull and some random bones, shuddering as he helps pile the bodies. We've desecrated the dead, Raj says, you tell me. Night shift over, they get back to barracks as the sun is rising, the men shouting and laughing about the death pavilion, mocking Dharma for caring so much about a bunch of dark bones and skins, staying clear of Raj. They are soon under their nets asleep and asleep, but Sam's head is filled with images of dead men, real and shrouded, as though the ghosts of his friends killed by war are no different from those he only came across in their long wait for safe passage to the next world. When his mother died, he imagined her in church heaven where all the good people went to be with Jesus and float around in a wispy clouded paradise. He was only 10 when he called that one, knowing, in knowing instinctively that adults should have more to go on than an image of wings and clouds and passively smiling faces, a place of perpetual boredom, it seemed to Sam, until the war. Boredom might be a kindness to those who suffered. He imagines them now sucked into a giant whirl of energy made up of all the good souls all those shrouds and bones. The more good souls, the greater the energy until the people, the animals, the plants, the entire world succumbs to that kind of purity. 
that kind of honesty. Heaven on earth, maybe that will be the final truth. Just that. Thank you. Isn't the imagery amazing? The book is so good. Um, so finally, uh, for our reading portion, Amita is going to introduce us to The Circus Train. Oh, this one is what is written in the on the tongue. And it will be at another story bookshop just after in the adjacent tent. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Genevieve uh, and Anne for that. And thanks to all of you for coming out here. And uh, if you've been here all day, I salute you because uh, it's been a long one and there's been a bit of rain. Um, anyway, so as Rachel said, my name is Amita. I wrote a novel called The Circus Train. It's my debut novel. It's the only one that I have to read from, so um, hopefully you'll like it. The section I'm reading is near the beginning. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the novel tells the story of a young girl named Lena. Um, and her father is, uh, his name is Theo, and he's an illusionist, and they live on board a traveling circus called the World of Wonders that crisscrosses Europe during the Second World War. Um, and so this is right at the start where they're about to get ready to uh, depart from London and start their tour. And uh, it actually takes place in the year 1938. Oh, and Lena is actually, she caught polio when she was young, so she is in a wheelchair, and she feels um, that she doesn't quite fit in with everybody on the circus, so that's where we'll begin. The Grand Dining Hall was the most magnificent carriage at the World of Wonders. Gargantuan chandeliers crafted from the finest Austrian crystal hung from the ceilings, making it look like diamonds were raining down on the tables. Blue paper flecked with gold leaf lined the walls, and the doors that faced the inner courtyard had been unlocked so that guests could go outside. From her table, Lena watched, enthralled, as performers entered clad in traditional Russian dress. The men wore white rubakas embroidered with red, blue, and green thread, and the women had colorful sarafans and glittering kokoshniks perched atop their heads. The tables had been rearranged in a rectangle around the perimeter of the hall, leaving the center open for performances and speeches. After the main courses had been served, it was tradition for Horace, who's a circus director, to give a speech. Tonight, he was dressed in a midnight blue tuxedo with tails and suede stripes, and he wore a matching suede top hat. As he walked to the podium, Lena heard snickering. She turned and saw Suze trying to stifle a laugh two tables over. Laura caught Lena watching them and gave her a sympathetic wave and smile. Lena smiled back sadly, then refocused her attention on Horace. Her father was right, she thought. As much as she hated to admit it, she would never be like any of the children here. It was best not to get involved with them. If I could have everyone's attention, please, Horace boomed. As is customary, this dinner marks the beginning of a journey that will take us through Europe I have been running this show for 10 years, and each time I think it can't get any better, it inevi inevitably does. The audience whistled and howled, and Lena joined in with the clapping. I shan't bore you with the intricacies of every act, costume, and musical piece that I've planned, but I would like to give the newcomers a brief glimpse of what to expect. Theo had left Lena's side at the start of Horace's speech and was now standing in the center of the room flanked by two fire jugglers. On his cue, the jugglers lit the ends, ends of their sticks and began tossing them high above. Behind them, the orchestra began to build, the strains of a traditional Russian folk song filling the carriage. Theo held up a handful of red, yellow, and orange feathers for all to see. They were the kind easily found in a children's crafting shop for pennies a pound. But in Theo's hands, the mundane became magical he scrunched them up into a tight ball in his fist. Then, with a flick of a wrist, he tossed them into the air at the exact same time the fire jugglers threw their sticks up. The audience gasped as the flames touched the feathers, setting them alight. A loud crack reverberated through the hall, a blast of orange illuminated the room, and out of the center, a magnificent firebird emerged. The onlookers pointed as the firebird gathered speed, floating majestically through the air, its wings were a rich ombre, starting from the deepest crimson at its breast and feathering out to canary yellow at the tips. 
A halo of orange encircled its head and a hint of gold glinted off the feathers whenever they caught the light. Suddenly, the firebird swooped down and stopped in front of Theo, who was moving his right arm like a conductor. The bird looked to the ceiling, hovering as though trapped in a trance. Then it spread its wings and soared upward, weaving in and out of the chandeliers. On the ground, Theo motioned to the fire jugglers to toss their sticks one last time. On the count of three, they threw them as high as they could, just as the orchestra reached the apex of its piece. Smoky ash filled the air, and the bird looked like it was about to burst through the roof when Theo made one final sharp hand movement. There was a loud bang as a brilliant ball of red washed over the entirety of the carriage, and then the whole room went dark. The lights, Horace yelled over the murmuring spectators, who were all trying to figure out exactly what had just transpired before their eyes. Chadwick, the lights, he scolded his assistant, who scurried to the back wall and flipped a switch flooding the room with beams of white. Lena rubbed her eyes, adjusting to the brightness, then took in the scene and folding in front of her. All around her, people were on their feet cheering. Children had abandoned their dessert and were clamoring around Theo, demanding to know how he did it. Young women batted their eyelashes coquettishly in her father's direction, showering him with praise. Shouts of, was it real? Where did it go? Echoed through the room. Beside Theo, Horace clambered back to his position at the podium, reveling in the spotlight. Bravo, he yelled, clapping his hands together, motioning to the orchestra, the jugglers, and Theo. Quiet, please, everyone, please be quiet, he ordered. A silence settled over the crowd. Thank you, gentlemen, for that spectacular performance. Remember, this is but a small taste of the magic and luxury you, you can expect to unfold over the course of the year. Now I invite all of you to raise a glass. Horace held up a flute of champagne, the golden liquid sloshing onto his hand. As the performers seated around her followed his lead, Lena grabbed the steel cup that was sitting upside down at her place setting. When she picked it up off the table, she gasped. Staring back at her was a single feather, the tip a sparkly gold. She plucked it off the white linen cloth and glanced at her father, who was looking directly at her. He smiled and winked. Welcome, Horace said, his lips turning up into his signature charismatic smile as those around him held up their glasses. To the world of wonders. Aren't these fabulous? So uh, if you're just joining us, I just want to recap that we have Genevieve Graham here who wrote Bluebird. We have Amita Perrick who wrote The Circus Train. And our other author is Anne Lazurko who wrote What is Written on the Tongue. And the conversation is entitled The Ripple Effect. And for me, as a voracious reader of historical fiction, what I find so unifying in these stories is that they show us through very different varied canvases the power of human resiliency that we can still draw strength from. And the other unifying theme in all of these stories and Genevieve's and Amita's and Anne's is that they are set in a world of wonders and making magic out of the mundane of the human experience, but also tied to the circumstance of war. And I found that so fascinating. So I have a few questions that I would like to ask our authors today, but I also am cognizant of the time and around the 45 minute mark of this session, I'm going to be opening it up to the audience and if you have something you'd like to ask we'll make sure that your questions are answered here so I did want to ask all of our authors and I can start with Genevieve here on the television uh, what comes first the characters the setting or the historical period or for a publishing term hook the hook that kind of lures the reader in uh, Genevieve what what comes first for you a historical hook, that would be it for me. Um, I write all Canadian history, and I write it because I don't know any of it, or I didn't before <laughs> I started all of this. Um, I slept through high school history, and I grew up and one day realized I didn't know anything about Canada, and I started to dig. So now I, I pick something in history that I really wanted to learn about, and in, in Bluebird it was prohibition for the most part, um, and I, I start to research that as in 
it's kind of like a black and white photo in the beginning for me and so I kind of research the basics and then I start doing the in-depth research and I see it as colorizing the photo bringing it to life and from that the characters start to emerge and through them I start to learn the direction of the story I'm very disorganized so I let them lead me <laughs> along the way and it's really amazing because the ramification of Genevieve's ripple in her passion for ex exhuming these amazing facets of our own history here in Canada is that while she's learning about these things that she didn't know of before, we're all learning through her in a very entertaining and romantic and wonderful and warm and humane way. Um, and next, Anne, what about you? What's first, history or character or setting? Uh, well, <laughs> for, for what is written on the tongue, um, it's actually loosely based on my dad. He was, I'm, my parents are Dutch immigrants to Canada in 1951, so I guess that makes me a first generation Canadian, who would figure, but um, they, he, they were under occupation as teenagers in Holland under Nazi occupation. And then shortly after the Second World War, dad was drafted and sent to Indonesia to try to reclaim the, Indi the East Indies at the time. And so the, the, the hook for me was um, the fact that my dad was in Indonesia and I learned, as I learned what happened there, I became more and more <laughs> alarmed, <laughs> sort of, but also engaged in this story. And so, uh, and, and then, then the research hooked me and that's, it, it kind of went from there. Um, the, the character of Sam is not my dad at all, but that was what sort of generated the, the ideas and the story. And then, and then, like I say, then researching the history, then it, then it was a lot like Genevieve, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and the setting all came through that. And traveling to Indonesia became a big part of what you called the atmosphere of the book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that that all came together. The echo of that experience, and I think it's really notable that you mention, and that all readers should know, just because there's something similar to our life backgrounds in a book doesn't mean that we're telling, she's not telling her dad's story, she's just representing uh, a very unique and interesting tenet of history that, to tell you the truth, I've never seen represented in fiction before, so it's, uh, I don't read a lot set in Indonesia in that time period, uh, so that's, that's amazing, and for you, Amita, you're... I mean, so much World War II fiction exists, um, but again, such a unique angle. So how did you start with the circus train? Yeah, so uh, I think I mentioned at the start of this uh, talk that this is my debut novel. Uh, it took a very long time to write, partly because I think I just tried to cram everything I liked into one book. Don't know why I didn't spread it out over a few. But uh, I, so with this one, I personally started with the characters. Um, I wanted to write about a magician and his daughter. I didn't know what the setting would be, and, uh, but I really liked history. And I had gone to a lecture about Greece's involvement in the Second World War, and that I just wanted to merge those things together. Um, and uh, my, I love circuses, I love performing, I grew up dancing and figure skating, and uh, I also have a science background, so I kind of just merged everything into one big novel. Um, again, I'm not sure that I would do that for my next book, but uh, that's how, how it came to be. You're, she's a renaissance author. Not many authors have the science and the artistic background in their head. I do not. Um, so Anne, we've talked about how your story takes us from occupied Netherlands to Indonesia. Amida, the circus train winding through Europe and then into Raisenstadt. Genevieve, the war front of Belgium and then Windsor and the Detroit River during Prohibition. Each of your stories paints remarkably different canvases. What holds your brush? The research, the travel to these places, either online or in person, we're coming out of the pandemic, or, whoop, there goes my phone. Wait, the end of this question is really good. <laughs> the research, the travel, or your imagination. So Genevieve, we'll start with you. Well, that's so hard. It's everything. I'm yeah. so, I love writing. I love everything about it. I never planned to be a writer. I didn't write till I was in my 40s, and it was only because I was such a big reader that I started to pick it up. And I, um, I don't know, I, I never expected to enjoy research. I never thought it was <laughs> gonna be fun at all, and now I can't get enough. In fact, when I research, 
I, I very often fall down the rabbit's hole and discover so many things that are, they're fascinating. And, and everything feels like it should go in the story, but in reality, of course, it can't, as you said. And um, so, but it, during, during doing that, I'm learning so much and it just fills me with so much passion for getting as much of this history out as I can. And along the way, of course, I fall in love with my characters and I, I can't wait to see what they end up doing. Um, you know, by the end, will they, will they survive? Will they fall in love? Will they, you know, there's a lot of questions with the, with the characters, but I think, I think probably it's the research that hangs on to me and says, don't leave your desk for 16 hours a day. You just sit here and, and dig through it all. And that's the hardest part because as authors often will come across something in research and it's like, oh my gosh, I need to throw all of this in here. And then our editors will make, a make us take it all out because it's boggling the story down. And I think every historical writer I've ever talked to has file folders filled with things that are dead in the water, but still active in our imagination, hopefully fertilizing so that we can write something later. So what about you, Anne? Is it the, the travel or is it the uh, research or your imagination that helped bring this canvas to life? I think, uh, you know, the whole kill your darlings thing is real. Like, yeah, absolutely. You can get so sucked down the rabbit hole of the research. And I do love research, but I think the characters really drive it for me because I, 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 I get to really like my characters even when they do some not great things um, <laughs> because, you know, characters are just like us, right? They're human. They're good. They're bad. They're ugly. They're all, all of the things that make us human. And, um, but even then, when the research takes the character to a dark place or redeems them somehow or, you know, you can use the research to, to set your character up and and have events happen that they mostly have to get through <laughs> right like like we put them in a lot of difficult situations a lot of the times um so again it's a combination but i think it's the characters that lead that lead my story and uh and then the research fills in the background and and i have to say traveling to some place that like i couldn't have written this story without the travel because I would have felt like a fraud talking about writing about Indonesia when I'd never been there. So that was a huge part of it. Um, but it did, again, inform what happens to the characters. And that's something a lot of authors are experiencing, that for two years, a lot of us travel. I mean, I, I extensively travel for the books uh, that I write because I want to immerse myself in those settings. But a lot of us were forced to <laughs> use good old Google Maps and our libraries uh, due to the pandemic. So quite wonderful you were able to get there before the world shut down. What about you, Amita? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, similar to what everyone has said, it's a combination of, of all three. Um, this book is completely from my imagination. I have no personal ties to really anything in the novel, but um, it's, it's, it starts with the research, I think, uh, you know, and as Rachel said, with historical fiction, a lot of us will have files and files of stuff that we've researched or that we found that we think is really cool and we'll file it away hoping that maybe we can use it one day. Who knows if that will ever happen. But, um, but again, similar to what um, Anne said, I think it's, it starts with the research because I'll, I'll hear about a cool historical fact or a time or something that happened, but then it's really the characters and how it affects them and the choices they make, that ends up driving the story. Um, so I would say, yeah, I think similar to Anne, it's a combo of both of the characters and the research. Yeah, and like you said, the the it's the characters' motivations. Exactly. That, that yeah. 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 That. Yeah. And why they make the choices that they do. And sometimes I don't know about the three of you, but uh, my characters go rogue, and I'm just typing to their dictation, and <laughs> my outline just goes out the window. Um, but one of the things that I always like to talk to historical writers about is the burden of capturing a moment or an era in the most authentic way possible given the research that we do, but also allowing the balance that we can still take the story where we need it to go. So in each of your books, there is a dark shadow. There's the, d I mean, from your reading earlier, Ge Genevieve, we've got scarring, the very real visceral wounds of war. 
Uh, and we've got, you know, death and bodies piling up and a war. And Amita, you take us into a world of wonders, but also a world of concentration camps and genocide. So how do you balance creating a world that's authentic to your time period but also allowing that hope and humanity and imagination to come forth. So Genevieve, how did, how did you find that? Gosh, that's so hard. What I hard know. questions you have, Rachel. I know, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're just I, all I so mean, interesting. <laughs> it's true, it's true. And they, they all have, everyone has different insights into this, but um, I mean, I think it comes back to, it always comes back to the characters. And as I said before, the research drives me because I'm captivated by it. But I do, just like these ladies, I, I make such a close connection with my characters, and I love them. They're all my darlings, even the bad guys. I think that the way to, the, the most important part about historical fiction to me is bringing the history back so that people will remember. And the way to do that is to make the characters as genuine as possible. And when you, when you write about human beings and get into their personalities and their loves and their, everything that goes on in their lives, and you know the research, like if I'm, if I'm walking down the street with Adele and I, and I see a storefront, I need to know the details, like what's in the window and what's it called and how much does it cost and how is she going to use it? Does she need other things to use it with? You know, there's these tiny little details that build the character into someone that you might know if you walked into the street back then. And they are, they are the ones that are carrying the history. They are the history. And so the way they survive through it is how you can create a story that reaches your heart. It's, it's all about how they, how they survive it, how, how genuine your characters are and how memorable they are to see if, you know, it, what history was like and to, to make people remember what it was like. If you love your characters or if you hate them, you're never going to forget the story and the truth of what happened. Oh, I love that. Capturing the sensibility of another time period so that all of us who perhaps haven't lived through it still has those details that help colorize it, as you said earlier. What about you, Anne? Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think the the research gives you the details um, and if you can have really authentic details you do create a, a, like a, a space for these characters to exist that that people can relate to and it doesn't matter what time period I think we're all we're all humans you know and it's like I said before we are all good and bad and and when you create uh, when you put those characters into these situations I think one of the things we can do through historical fiction, if we do it well, is create uh, empathy for, for the characters themselves, but also for the situation that they are in. And so we can understand if they do something that we, we might question now, um, that, that we can see it in context then, if we've created that atmosphere for them to live in. So I think that's a big part of that. What about you, This Amita? is a very difficult question, Rachel. I'm <laughs> glad I was last. I still don't have a perfect answer, so bear with me. But uh, you know, you mentioned the word burden um, in the question with historical fiction, and I think, I think that's kind of true because you know we write about um, things that are rooted in fact, right? They really happen. Like people lived through this. All you know, in all of our books, like all of these events really happened. But I think the important distinction that um, I always like to remember for myself as a writer is that you know we're telling one story or two stories. We're not telling a story that's representative of everybody who lived through um, that specific time period. And so then it becomes a little more personalized. Um, so I guess with respect to, I just don't think it's possible to represent a historical time period in a way that every reader will be pleased with because everybody has their own interpretations and their own experience. Um, but then with respect to the actual characters and you know resilience and hope and things, I just think that's human nature. Like in the darkest of times, um, people have just shown over and over again how they managed to pull, pull through and that's what's so beautiful about the human spirit. And I think one of the best things about historical fiction is it doesn't matter that you didn't specifically, well, Maybe some readers did live through the things that our you know characters have gone through, but 
you can still empathize, you know, Anne said you have empathy for what the characters are dealing with. Um, you can sometimes relate to what they're going through and the decisions they make, whether they're good or bad. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, <laughs> it's true, and I think that with all of your books, you mentioned that you can't have that one book that encompasses every uh, story and represents every aspect of a war, per se, but all of your books excavate an experience that is so unique and anomalous to your stories. And that's the amazing thing about historical fiction is you can pick where you want to spend your time and what experience you want to live. So we're gonna get into audience questions in just a second, but the last question I did wanna ask all three of our authors is, since we're dealing with the ripple effect here, if Genevieve, your prospective or already established readers can know one thing you want them to take away from your stories, what would it be? I mean, you've kind of hinted at some great stuff already, but I'll bug well, you anyway. <laughs> the most important thing to me is that people walk away from my books realizing that Canadian history is not as boring as you think it is. Um, it's not, you know, the fur trade. It's not the uh, War of 1812 and the Plains of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. And it's not American history, it's not UK history. Canadian history has so many incredible stories and uh, Bluebird was my seventh. And I mean, that's just that's just the tip of the ice iceberg when it comes to Canadian history and all the adventures and stories that are in there. So yeah, it's my mission to show that Canadian history is not as boring as you think. And thanks to many authors that Genevieve's books have been doing so exceptionally well because it is opening the doors for other authors to also be able to write Canadian set stories, which in historical fiction, the publishing industry wasn't always embracing as much as I think we could have. Uh, what about you, Anne? What do you want readers to take away from your book? Uh, my, my first book was set in, in early Saskatchewan history, and this one's in Indonesia. And I think maybe just, and, and it comes through in my book, the idea that, that history is in itself important, no matter w which history yeah. it is, that we understand what happened, what happened before. Um, there's a term, actually, an Indonesian term, Mengedi, and it means this writing of history, this particular writing of history. Uh, going back to what you said, you know, it's just about this one angle on this this historical fact. But I like that idea that that you know we can read it and we can take something away from it, and hopefully that will inform us into the future, if that makes sense. <laughs> but that's kind of what I would like to see happen with my books. What about you, Amita? Yeah, so I have two things I wanted to share. So before I share what I hope readers will take away from my novel, I just have a really fun fact. Um, and I think it's really appropriate to share it here because of where we're located. Uh, so um, this book took me six years to write and then another 18 months or so to edit with my editors. So it was a very long process. And uh, in earlier drafts of the novel, I'd actually set a chunk of it in Toronto. And uh, I'd had Lena, the character, um, go to Victoria College, and she actually lived at Annesley Hall, which is right across the road from us. Oh my gosh, that's and so, cool. so there's this entire section that is now just sitting on my hard drive, and I just thought it felt appropriate to um, share with everyone, given where we're located. But no, in terms of what I want readers to take away from the book, it's it, it's really a story of of hope. And you know, I, I know maybe it sounds a bit cliched, but. Um, yeah, I, w I wanted to take people on a journey and uh, take them into another world and leave them feeling a bit hopeful about life and about love. I love that. These are all such fabulous books. <laughs> Yay. Um, and so does anyone in the audience have a question for one of our authors or all three? years to write uh, the novel how many of those years have you spent actually writing and like actually thinking about the, the, about the novel yeah I don't know everything is just sort of a blur now no I'm kidding um <laughs> I think it took me about a year to do the first draft which it was not called the circus train um, there was no train at all actually it, the entire book was set between Greece and Toronto so it it's basically a different book 
um, with the exception of you know the two main characters, three main characters. But um, I was writing. I would say I would write slash edit five days a week, I think, in addition to kind of work and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I never really stopped. I, the, only, the only time I stopped writing was when I would send it out to agents, um, and then I wouldn't hear anything for a while. And then I would sort of think to myself, okay, well, I'm gonna have to start writing again because it's not getting me an agent. So yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did. <laughs> about uh, research, which obviously, um, but was there any uh, like particular like anecdote you dug up, something that like really grabbed your interest or you thought was like an interesting fun fact that didn't make it into the book? Just, you know, one piece of history you think would be fun for us to know. Did you hear that, Genevieve? I did. Um, I think I included, well, pretty much all the really fun things that I found. I love, um, if I can't include them, I always put them in the end at a note to readers, um, where, which sums up all the, the real history that I've, that I've done to come up with the book. Um, I think my favorite part about writing this book was talking about the smugglers and the different ways that they managed to smuggle all this illegal booze across, across the Detroit River from um, Windsor over to Detroit. Um, so many stories of prohibition are so fantastic, like the things that um, in the speakeasies and the, the blind pigs, which is what they call the taverns or saloons. Um, and the reason they called it like the blind pig was because you weren't allowed to buy booze. You, you were allowed to pay to see a, a blind pig entertain you or something like that. You could pay for a meal, but you could never pay for booze. And, uh, and the way they would smuggle it across the river, there's a story about one fellow who um, carried a dozen eggs across the frozen river and they were filled with whiskey so i'm not sure how that <laughs> happened but that apparently is a true story and yeah i i think i included pretty much everything that i love um there's a i don't know there's a great underworld that i that i really enjoyed writing about um this is just an anecdote from, from my dad, actually. Uh, when he was in Indonesia, they suffered a lot from heat rash and, you know, all these things because it was... Well, when my sister and I were there, it was July, and it was plus 40 and 80% humidity, and we're two menopausal women. <laughs> <laughs> we were ugly the whole time. <laughs> but, but, but my dad talked about it, it took six months for them to get used to to the heat and, and everything else there. But he ended up uh, with some sort of a virus. They don't know. He was in a coma for, for weeks. The doctors didn't know what it was. He had this huge fever. And then, it, and then uh, it, they, they tested him and studied him and, and all of these things. And this doctor, a local doctor, came and he said, he has the fever. He'll be fine. And apparently he was. <laughs> they, did, they never did figure out what that was. So I had this happen to my character, Sam, in a, at an appropriate moment because I thought that, well, it was actually true and, <laughs> and kind of an interesting thing that that could happen and no, no long-term effects, nothing. It just happened, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to go back eight years in my head and remember all the stuff that didn't make it in. Um, one thing that did make it in that I've mentioned in a few virtual talks I've done is... Um, there is, a, there is mention of a transit camp slash concentration camp in the novel called Theresienstadt. And um, it functioned like a real town, and I use that term loosely because um, things come to light later on that we know it wasn't real. But um, they, the not Germans had kind of set it up as uh, it's going to be administered by Jews and run by Jews, and, and they'll have hospitals and schools and libraries and everything. And they actually had... Um, a soccer league so they had you know a bunch of different teams playing soccer on a pitch every week um, and I just thought that was amazing there's actually a documentary about it I think believe it's called Liga Terezin so Terezinstad is um, kind of like the English the English term for 
um, Terezin, and that Terezin is like the Czech term. Um, so yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. So we're just at the five minute mark uh, before we have to clear out, so more exciting bookish things can happen. Uh, so does anyone else have one more question for our authors? Yeah. Uh, thank you, I've really enjoyed this uh, presentation and so on. And uh, just the, uh, your research, knowing about your research has been so interesting. And Anne, I actually have a question for you because you said that you went to Indonesia and just knowing that a book is set there, which is quite different from a lot of novels out there, it's, it's fascinating. I just wondered when you were doing the research, did you find that there was a difference or different perspectives when you read things here in the West and when you went there to Indonesia and researched things? And did that perspective help you in develop your stories and characters? Um, it, it, it was it was quite an interesting thing. Um, what I did find about this particular, uh, from 1945 to 50, with the Dutch in Indonesia, was that there was very little written about it. The Dutch silenced that whole period. They're, they're, they, they're the, my cousins my age know very little about what happened there, if you can believe that. And I think it's a little bit of their colonial history, just as we have been with uh, residential schools. Uh, there's been a lot of, of silencing of it, and it's only in the last couple of years that they've really started to address it. So that was their perspective. And in Indonesia, the history is all written in very nationalistic terms, right? And so there's, I had to really work to find a middling truth, if you like, um, that, that, that kind of made sense and was as accurate as I could make it. So my trip there... That, that's kind of what I discovered was, was it was hard to find sort of really, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like analytical writing about it. So a lot of my trip was talking to local people and, and, and experiencing the atmosphere and the place for, for the setting and that sort of thing. So, so it, was, it was difficult. It was actually difficult to find really good history about the, about from, from either side. <laughs> Well, this was an amazing evening, uh, and thank you, Genevieve, for magically appearing on our screens in your beautiful blue top. Everybody go and buy Bluebird uh, and follow Genevieve. Uh, Anne and Amita and myself will all be signing over at another Story Bookshop tent. Um, but thank you all for coming, for the wonderful questions, and for engaging in the ripple effect that historical fiction can have throughout our lives and our experiences, and hopefully our inspiration in moments of human resiliency and hope. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. No, thank you, Rachel. Bye.